The previous lecture in our series on ancient Near Eastern mythology focused on the Canaanites and the Hittites, two of the smaller peoples, the non-imperial peoples of the ancient Near East. And I contrasted them with the Egyptians and the cultures of Mesopotamia, the great superpowers of the Near East. I referred to connections between these powers and to the relevance of myth for understanding the way that cultures were related one to the other. The idea that myths were transmitted from culture to culture and that there were variants within those myths. Today's lecture will focus on archaeology, science, and ideology. We will look at the way that the material from the ancient Near East was uncovered, deciphered, and organized. And at the conclusion of our lecture, I will refer to some of the ideological debates raging about the subject of the ancient Near East. Though it may seem to be in the distant past, it has relevance for contemporary discourse. We will survey major developments in archaeology in this area and focus on the question of terminology because early on in the history of archaeology in the Near East, the subject was known as biblical archaeology. And the move away from that terminology and that idea, the move away from a Bible-centered view of the ancient Near East was a very contested one and one that still is still being contested. From ideology, let us move to method. Archaeological method in the ancient Near East depends on two broad concepts and their implementation. The importance of stratigraphy, stratification, and the centrality of pottery. In the early years of archaeology in this area, whether we call it biblical archaeology or ancient Near Eastern archaeology, the focus was on the artifacts, not on the place that they were found. In fact, there was a long period in which scientists, as well as the lay public, were interested in objects. If the objects had writing on them, how much the better. But if they didn't, they can still they could still reveal something about the ancient culture. There was a kind of plunder aspect to this. Western archaeologists going to Middle Eastern countries, taking artifacts and removing them to Western museums. And the great collections of the Louvre in Paris, of the British Museum in London, of American museums such as the, the Brooklyn Museum in New York, were built up by the removal of artifacts from the ancient Near East. This was facilitated by the cultural and political imperialism of the European powers, which enabled them to take what they wanted. And in the American case, it was facilitated by the growing American wealth and by the nurturing in America of the idea of collecting. In a sense, we, as Americans were competing with Europeans. If there were great collections of Near Eastern artifacts in Paris and London, there needed to be great collections in New York, Boston, and Washington. We didn't want to be embarrassed in terms of our cultural heritage. So we have this plunder period, or what one of my colleagues refers to as the hunting and gathering period of archaeology. Let's go out there get the object, bring it back, see what it tells us. As the 19th century closes and the 20th century begins, we move to emphasis on the site, on the place where the object is found. And we have a type of synthesis, the object and the place where that object was found need each other. They don't tell us the whole story unless they have each other. If you have an object and you don't know how it was found, where it was, who uncovered it, you don't really have the whole story. So sites became important. 
how to investigate sites became the methodological focus of archaeologists. With this focus on sites came an awareness of strata, of levels. An awareness that settlement at many sites in the Near East extended over millennia, and that over time, layers of human habitation were built one on top of another. And this stratification was the way that TELS, spelled T-E-L-S or T-E-L-L-S, TELS, the singular TEL, were formed. A TEL is a settlement mound formed over centuries by successive human habitation. And the Near East is riddled with them, literally thousands of them. Many tells have become famous for what they have revealed about the past. For example, Tel El Amarna in Egypt, now that's a modern name for an ancient site, the site of Aket Aten, the city of the horizon of the Aten, the city of Akhenaten, and his queen Nefertiti. The remains of this city were found at the site identified by archaeologists as, as Tel El Amarna, hence the name Amarna Letters, the letters I've referred to a number of times, which show the connections between Mesopotamia and Egypt. Or, on the subject of Tel, an example for Mesopotamia, Tel Kuyunjuk, today part of the Iraqi city of Mosul, the first excavations, the first European excavations in Iraq began there in the 1840s, and slowly this tell gave up its secrets. It was the Assyrian city of Nineveh. On it was the palace of Sennacherib, the 7th century BC king, removed, renowned as the destroyer of Babylon. Nineveh was a name that also evoked a connection to the Bible. And here we return to the biblical ancient Near Eastern nexus of interest among Westerners. What was Nineveh? Nineveh was the city to which the prophet Jonah was supposed to go to prophesy. What was his message? In another 40 days, Nineveh will fall if the people don't repent. So readers of the Bible knew about Nineveh. Here Nineveh was discovered. How exciting! This generated a lot of interest in archaeology. Digging through tells in both Egypt and Mesopotamia and elsewhere in the Near East, archaeologists were able to reconstruct the history of any given settlement and in this way to trace the rise and fall of city-states. One of the tragedies of the aftermath of the 2003 war in Iraq is the plundering of tells. That is, thousands of archaeological sites have been left unguarded in Iraq, and local thieves organized in gangs are going into these tells and digging up the artifacts. And to return to our conversation about sites and artifacts, naturally these thieves are not interested in the site. In fact, by forcibly and hurriedly removing the artifacts, they are destroying the site but they can take the artifact and sell it. And this is what seems to be important. The importance of tells was very beautifully described by uh, one of the great German Assyriologists, Wolfram von Soden, in this way. They give us an inestimable abundance of material remains, written sources, architecture, and art, all of which tell us about the ancient Near East. So this sequence of settlement, the layers of habitation, have been designated by pottery type. This is the way archaeologists identify the levels of habitation. They name them after the type of pottery. For the pottery of every historical period is distinctive in terms of the composition of the clay, the way that it's shaped, the way that it's baked, and if it's decorated the way that it's decorated. Pottery can be shattered, it can be scattered, but it doesn't disintegrate. It hangs around at that level of habitation. So it becomes a clock, a way to tell when the site 
had human habitation. Pottery production began approximately 8,000 years ago in 6,000 BC. Again, very approximately. I'm referring to the beginning of the Neolithic, which occurs at different times in the Near East. And throughout the area, there were the materials to make pottery. We've alluded to this before, water, clay, fuel. There were also pigments, natural dyes with which to dedicate the pottery. Now, not all sites had potters. If there was pottery made, it was kept. But there were sites we refer to as aceramic. There was no pottery, but that's quite rare. Now, as students of the ancient Near East, we need to remember that when we speak of pottery in these sites, this is not an arts and crafts reference. That is, it's not that people had a hobby and they were making pots. Rather, pottery was an essential of civilized life. It was the way that you made drinking vessels, eating vessels. It was the way that you fashioned religious items. The gods were fashioned out of clay. Art was expressed through pottery, yes, but it was functional art. It wasn't art purely for expression. So stratigraphy, the awareness of levels and the study of pottery, these became the foundations of scientific archaeology. Armed with these techniques, archaeologists found as much interest in the site as in the discovery of artifacts. And from the 1920s and 30s on, we have hundreds of excavations of Near Eastern tells. The ideal in a tell excavation is to go through all of the layers of habitation until you reach the deepest layer. This doesn't always happen because of the exigencies of work and the money and effort that's involved, but that was the ideal set by early archaeologists. In the beginning of archaeology, in this area, this cultural area. Archaeology and the interest in it in the West was conditioned by what we might call today a biblical worldview. People were interested in it because it could tell them about the Bible. They were familiar with these places, with kings, with religious figures from the Bible. Now the sites of biblical history were being uncovered. How could archaeology tell them about the Bible? Sir Leonard Woolley, the great British archaeologist, excavated at Ur, in which he uncovered the Royal Cemetery and its spectacular collection of grave goods, including gold jewelry. This caught the imagination of Western readers, and his findings made headlines in newspapers throughout the world. His Archaeological excavations were also supported by newspapers because it made good press. Now, an important factor in this press, in this publicity, was the connection to the Bible. Uh, it turns out that to Woolley personally, this wasn't that important. He was interested in the artifacts and the sites themselves, but he was a very smart academician and researcher. He knew how to get funding, which is the key to... Uh, being able to do research. He knew that Ur was familiar to readers of Genesis. It was the city from which Abraham's family came. And those eager to, quote, prove the biblical truth, unquote, which was a common cultural move in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Bible can be proven to be true if we look at archaeology. This made the public want to know more about Ur. Similar, in many ways, to what I was saying about Nineveh. People want to know about Nineveh because Jonah the prophet was sent to Nineveh. So, for Woolley and his team, this was a kind of godsend. Furthermore, Woolley, in his excavation reports, said he had found at the lowest level in his tell at Ur and at other places what he called the flood layer, proof that there had been a great flood.